Hi everyone, good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Program's broadcast. Today is Tuesday, October 20th, 2020. In tonight's broadcast, I'm going to be talking about prioritizing academics and therapy. Really, when I say therapy, I'm talking about finding a, a way to, to value overall mental health above simply looking at academics. So I'll talk about that at length. I don't think there's a simple answer. In fact, in preparation for tonight's broadcast, I was thinking about this. I was talking to some some prospective parents today as they were considering the option. You get this question so often when people are considering uh, wilderness therapy for the child. Like, what about falling behind? Academics becomes this this kind of universal measure for parents to, to that's an indication of whether or not their child is doing well. In fact. It might not be surprising for you to learn that the number one most common complaint by parents on our application and our application process, and it's really not a a close close second, is academic struggle, academic failure, academic refusal. So, So with that in mind, that becomes a litmus test. That becomes a measure. But what I wanted to say tonight as at the outset was I don't think it's a simple equation. I don't think, as I was talking to these parents, you know, the part of academics is in, is motivating. Part of academics is can be somebody's passion, somebody's purpose. Um, it can challenge somebody in, in positive ways. It, it, it can also cause pressure and anxiety. So at the outset of tonight's broadcast, perhaps what I want to say most definitively is I'm not here tonight to tell you how to do it. I'm not here tonight to tell you how to decide or what to decide with regard to you prioritizing your child. I'll give you stories and examples. And like always, I really want to talk tonight about a shift in perspective, a a shift in our thinking as it applies to academics. Every single time I think of this idea about where we put academics in the overall picture of mental health, I I think of the movie Goodwill Hunting. And so I'm going to share with you a piece of dialogue. This is a scene. Some of you, I imagine most people listening to this have seen the movie Goodwill Hunting. If if academics and therapy are a question for you, I would encourage you to go back and look at and watch Goodwill Hunting. It's an excellent, in fact, in my opinion, it's the best depiction of therapy that we've ever seen cin- cinematically. You know, the, the the character played by Robin Williams and Will Hunting, the character played by Matt Damon, and their relationship is, for me, the greatest illustration of a therapeutic relationship. Although there are some rough edges and some things I wouldn't replicate, the the the, the bonding, the connection, the, the attunement, the love, the caring, and the authenticity is all there. So here's the scene. Will Hunting is a troubled young adult and who's getting into trouble, who's getting arrested, who's spending his time partying with with friends and and seemingly going nowhere. And at the same time, he has this remarkable intellect. And so in in lieu of sentencing, a Harvard professor or an MIT professor, excuse me, decides that he's going to mentor and uh, kind of support Will and and tells the judge that that he's going to watch over him and guide him. And so Jerry is this MIT professor who's mentoring Will with his academics. And Sean is played by Robin Williams, is the therapist that Jerry gets on board to kind of help him with Will. And so they're sitting in the bar having this debate about this, this difference in perspective about where academic slash career success should fit in and where overall mental health should fit in. So, so Jerry says... In 1905, there were hundreds of professors renowned for their studies of the universe, but it was a 26-year-old Swiss patent clerk doing physics in his spare time who changed the world. Can you imagine if Einstein would have given up just so he could get drunk with his buddies in Vienna? We would, we all would have lost something. And he makes a motion to the bartender, and Tim would have never heard of him. Sean responds, pretty dramatic, Jerry. Jerry responds, no, it's not, Sean. This boy has that gift. He just doesn't have the direction for it. We can give him that. Sean says, hey, Jerry, 
In the 1960s, there was a young man who had just graduated from the University of Michigan who was doing brilliant work in mathematics, specifically bounded harmonic functions. Then he went to Berkeley, where he was an assistant professor and showed amazing potential. Then he moved to Montana and blew the competition away. Jerry asks, yeah, so who was he? Sean responds, Ted Kaczynski. Jerry says, never heard of him. Then Sean motions to the bartender and says, hey, Timmy. Tim says, yo. Sean asks, who's Ted Kaczynski? Kaczynski? And Tim answers the Unabomber. While this is a, a story of fiction, it illustrates what can happen when we overvalue academics in the process. And so again, it's not about deciding, making a specific decision for you and your child, but it is to put it in perspective, to begin to think about where it fits in the overall, overall plan. And for parents, thinking about academics and career success is easy to understand because it is your child's gateway to being a functional adult, to, to, to being successful, successful enough to be able to support themselves. And I would say with, with, with not too much, uh, too much comedy, I would say it also is closer and closer to them getting uh, to be able to support themselves so that you don't have to support them. So it makes sense. And, and since they are children, academics is their job. So that's the backdrop with, with which we start. I love this these slides. I've borrowed them from a couple of presentations and shared them a couple of times, but I want to share them with you. Um, I borrowed them from a presentation that was done years ago by somebody else called What's Wrong with the Kids Today? With Kids Today. And I share some quotes. We live in a dec decaying age. Young people no longer respect their parents. They are rude and impatient. They frequently inhabit bars and have no self-control. Next quote. What is happening to our young people? They disrespect their elders. They disobey their parents. They ignore the law. They riot in the streets, inflamed with wild notions. Their morals are decaying. What has become of them? Next quote. The children now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority, and show disrespect to their elders. They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents, chatter before company, and are tyrants over their teachers. And then the next quote, the young people of today think nothing but themselves. They have no reference for parents or old age. They are impatient of all restraint. They talk as if they alone knew everything. And what passes for wisdom with us is foolishness with them. As for girls, they are forward and modest and unwomenly in speech, behavior and dress. And of course, these quotes are thousands, in some cases, years old. Hundreds at best. The, the idea is that I think sometimes it's easy for us to lose perspective. It's easy us, us for have this myopic view of our life. I've always said I, I was hoping that, that I would belong to the first generation of adults that would look at children uh, through an understanding lens through seeing the similarities and that we wouldn't make the mistake that virtually every generation of adults makes with children, which is to attribute all kinds of judgment and negativity to them, to have a pessimistic viewpoint with, with, with the up, the, the generation that we're, that we're raising that, that that's up and coming. So I love these two quotes. Conrad Gessner said, he warned, he warned, warned, excuse me, of information overload. This overabundance is confusing and harmful to the mind. He urged governments to regulate and limit its use. And uh, Niccolo Parati, I believe is how you pronounce it. The quote goes, because now that anyone is free to post whatever they wish, they often disregard that which is best and instead write that which would best be forgotten. And even when they write something worthwhile, they twist it and corrupt it to a point where it would be much better to do it without such sites, rather than spreading falsehoods all over the world. And these two quotes, of course, were not about our current day. They were related to the printing press. So for centuries and, and for thousands of years, it has become easy for us to look at the values, the challenges, the difficulties, the the 
the, the, the turmoil of youth and to relegate them to something bad, to, to something wrong. And, and in so doing, we lose perspective. And that's what tonight's about. It's about perspective. It's about putting academics in perspective. There was an old uh, commercial when I was young, and I don't know if some of you saw this, but it showed a father reading a newspaper, reading a paper, and his, his young son came up to him and, and, and kept you know, nagging him and pulling at, 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 his, at his pajama pants and saying, you know, can we, can we play? Can we spend some time together? And finally, in frustration because the father just wanted to relax and, and read his paper, he took the last page of the paper and he ripped it into shreds and he said to his son, there's a, there's a map of the earth on here. And if you can put that, this together, then I'll play with you. Or when you're done putting this together, I'll play with you. And his son came back just moments later, ha having put together the, this map of the world. And his father was perplexed and shocked and said, how did you do that so quickly? And he said, you see, on the other side of, of the picture of the map, there was a picture of a family. And once I put the family together, the map on the other side just fit into place. Obviously, it's just a cute commercial, kind of a, a sappy commercial. But it is this idea that when we get our, our stuff together, when we get our, our, our minds together, when we get our mental health together, then all the ac academic potential can be unlocked. It's the same kind of idea that we talk about with learning differences. When we understand what learning differences are, when you, if those of you who have children on the autism spectrum disorder, part of what you've discovered in this process is that once you understand and diagnose your child, you see their learning differences or their social differences or what's causing them anxiety. Once you do that, the academics fall into place. The academics, I'll talk about this a little bit later, the academics become this, this measuring stick about how well the child is doing, but there's something beneath that. My wife and I are watching a new series on Apple TV Plus called Away. The jury's still out about whether or not we, we love the series, and we're a couple of episodes in. But there's a, there's a, a storyline where one of the astronauts, the, the, the woman who's the commander of this, the, this spaceship that's thousands of miles away from Earth on its way to Mars. Um, her husband at home falls sick and the teenage daughter, the young teenage daughter is there to take care of her father. And she's she's resistant to go back to school. And after two weeks, the father finally insists. He's recovering in the hospital and he insists that she go back to school. And then the father and the mother, the mother's this astronaut in space on her way to Mars. The father and the mother are talking on cell phone, how convenient the technology is that far along in this futuristic show, but they're talking. And the mother says something that I thought was fascinating and insightful. She said to her husband, I wonder why. I wonder why she doesn't want to go to school. And, and so part of the episode is us learning what it was that, that caused the, the refusal, the school refusal. In this specific example, this specific storyline, it's a very unique circumstance, but I loved the mother, the character's instinct to be curious about why. And, and that goes back to a really foundational idea to ask why. We can all easily get so focused on outcomes, on correct behavior, on good behavior, that we walk right past asking the question, becoming curious about why and what's going on. And it is in that exploration so many times we, we find, first of all, the, the root or the core issue and the solution to the issue. So if nothing else, for those of you listening to this podcast, if, if you walk away from, from with nothing else from what I have to say this evening, what I hope you walk away from with is the idea that look at the behavior and follow it like, like, a, like a trail of crumbs that lead you back home to the source, to, to, the, to the root issue, to, to the real issue. If you pay too much attention to behavior 
if that becomes your your hyper focus you are falling right in line with what the symptom is designed to do which is to distract you and in this case the child from the authentic wound the authentic suffering the the, the real pain the underlying pain now you get to have boundaries that that's a part of this process I, I said to the staff in my training the last couple of weeks you have a job out there you're supposed to get from point a to point b on a daily basis and keep everybody alive and safe that's your job and that job becomes similar to the parents job at home which is feed your children keep them safe get them in school help them to graduate support them to graduate high school and to launch themselves into the world that's that's their job yours is a lot more simple than the parents but it becomes the same in the sense that uh, surrounded around that task you will have difficulties challenges dilemmas processes cycles symptoms that you have to deal with that you have to navigate and don't let any therapist in the world including me tell you that they absolutely know the answer the solution but rather find therapists and, and educators that can support you in discovering your answer like i've said recently in the last several of these broadcasts this is about developing a new sensibility or a new level of consciousness speaking of einstein i shared the quote we cannot solve the problem he said from the same level of consciousness in which the problem was created in other words if we're thinking about things behaviorally and thinking of school as the goal and we try to solve the problem inside of that context we're not going to solve it we have to think above and beyond that we have to get curious about what it means like the character that i shared with you in the series that my wife and i are watching we have to ask the question i wonder why i wonder what's going on could it be a learning difficulty disability there's a huge folks a huge correlation with learning disabilities and and mental health as it shows up in school with school failure with school refusal with antisocial behavior with substance abuse there is an enormous correlation and think about that think about how much we are missing in this country in, in this world when we don't understand the children who have learning differences are, are just trying to distract and solve for their their anxiety and get everybody off track from what what for them is a very very shameful experience to look at what they would consider a deficit a shameful deficit so the effects of learning differences on behavior it can be frustration self-doubt confusion anger resentment sadness hopelessness fear defiance hurt shame depression loneliness and learned helplessness getting behind you know this is their job like i said it's the one thing as a child that is the principal universal responsibility of a child which is to be adequate or successful in school to do to pass so there's so much weight and pressure on that it also is the area of in life where work ethic can begin to be developed i i you know when we brought in sanford shapiro a, a cognitive specialist to help us make sure that our, our our academic curriculum and i'll talk about that a little bit later was sensitive to learning differences and learning styles i i i think i i shared in in the group training this experience I remember being in the seventh grade and I don't remember lots of days in the seventh grade or lots of moments in the seventh grade I remember a handful of experiences from that year one of them I remember was I was sitting in Mr Jasper's class and Mr Jasper was a history teacher and I wasn't paying attention and Mr Jasper asked me a question that I didn't know the answer to because I, I hadn't made, been paying attention. And I remember feeling on the spot and humiliated, and I made some kind of joke for which I was reprimanded. 
That was one moment. And said, I, since I don't have any learning differences that affect my academic pursuits, imagine what it's like for somebody that suffers from a learning disability. Children with, with um, learning differences, specifically ADHD, are criticized hundreds, thousands of more times during their academic career than those without it, without ADHD. And all it is is that their brain is atypical, which isn't bad. Some of the greatest minds, inventors, greatest leaders of of of, of invention of industry have been have have had a brain that that has ADHD. And so when you start to see the class clown, when you start to see acting out, when you start to see defiance, and again, the goal of the symptom, let me make this clear, the goal of the symptom in terms of a mental health picture is to distract, to protect the child in this case from the core wound, the core shame, the core negative feeling. And so if you can get focused on oppositional defiant disorder, which is a, a disorder, if you can get focused on that as the problem, then you don't have to deal with anxiety and shame or grief or fear. If, if you can get focused on a, a child having difficulty respecting parental authority, substance use, then the, the symptom has effectively distracted everybody from the feelings that are underneath. Let's talk about how we use wilderness. We have in wilderness a curriculum. We are a we are we have a curriculum that is um, certified by the Northwest um, Association of Schools. So we have a, we are in essence a school, and we have teachers that work off site. It's, it's not a robust curriculum. It's a half a year of PE, if they complete it all, PE, English, psychology, and earth sciences. That's our curriculum. So if they complete all of their curriculum, they can get a half a credit, which is a half a year in each of those subjects. And these are not advanced versions of it in many cases. But what it gives us is it gives us a, a, a task to work on. I always thought it was ridiculous in wilderness therapy to have a, a program that's set up where, where the most common complaint is academic struggles. And then to remove academics. And then to pat ourselves on the back for how well we're doing treating your children. That seems ridiculous. And it seems intellectually dishonest. So we have it in part to see what comes up for them. We have it in part to see how they, they, they operate, behave in kind of a more natural environment, meaning an environment that looks more like mainstream. We, we just bring it in for that purpose. We want it to mimic the relationship that they have with teachers and authority figures. Like I said, they can get grades and credits. We get to we get to assess how they respond during academic times. Are they acting out? Are they distracting? Do they turn into the, to the class clown? Do they refuse? Do they appear to be unmotivated or not able to complete tasks? All those things become a natural uh, part of the natural observation. Natural observation is in contrast to objective formal testing. Right? Natural observation is what a professional or an observer will, will look at when somebody's just doing their thing. So we get natural observation in, in, in addition to any of the, the formal testing that you might order. It helps us to understand, explain, and treat issues related to school performance, right? In real time instead of just by report. Um, we, we do it because it's a little bit of balance. Wilderness therapy is... We don't want it to be an escape from their problems, right? We want it to be to present challenges similar to the way that home life presents challenges. 
Um, we want them to, to, to be continued. We believe, I, I want to be clear while I'm going to talk about reprioritizing academics. Um, we want to emphasize the idea that we believe academics are important and we, for, for, for most students, most of our clients are on an academic track and we encourage and support that. And we even think, like I said at the outset, that it can be an important part of what inspires many of our students. Um, we do discourage because of experience. I want to be clear about this. Because of experience, not theoretically, we discourage typically students going back going back to their previous school. It doesn't prevent problems, but it, it's, it's, it's sort of a way to support them. It's hard for any of us, let alone children who are developmentally vulnerable, to walk back in the same old contexts and not be triggered. In, in AA or in NA, they will talk about changing your playground and your playmates as a part of your recovery. So that's why you're going to be getting recommendations where going back to the same school is going to be a very exceptional and rare recommendation. Um, good academics should challenge them. But again, we want to make sure that they have the resources, that, they, that any learning differences are known, and, and even what comes up for them emotionally. Because if you are an anxious child, if anxiety is something you're predisposed to, then that can attach itself to anything, including school or work or sex or anything. So we want to make sure that, that there's a challenge, but also observe, does that challenge become over, overwhelming and lead to poor performance? You know, academics is a place to challenge, express themselves, to learn, to communicate, to be creative and to feel. I want to take this moment to just share my own story. And it's, I only share it anecdotally as one story, just to give you a reference point. In fact, I shared it with a prospective parent today. I dropped out of high school when I was 16. I left high school. I ended up going back a couple of years later. And through really a, a lot of uh, accommodations was able to graduate. And then three years later, I started college. So I started college when I was 21. So I, I didn't go to school except for taking two classes. Most of it was work study. I didn't go to school from the age of 16 to the age of 21. And then when I got to school at 21 in college, I graduated in three and a half years with my bachelor's degree with straight A's. Then I went on graduate school. I, I know I'm atypical. I know I'm not the norm, but I, I illustrate powerfully that we have to let go of the idea of traditional timelines sometimes that, that our children, basically what our children in, in wilderness therapy are telling us is that they need something different, that, that, that the prescribed mainstream ideas, contexts, right? aren't working for them. So part of the request, you, you hear that phrase, it's a cry for help. You've heard that before. What, what we mean by that is not that it's a slightly subconscious cry for help that the child with a little bit of prodding can become aware of. What we're saying is that the behavior is telling us that something isn't working. Often when I'm talking about family work, I, I often say, it's not working for, you know, your your childhood, your context, kind of what you learn that's, that's brought you this far isn't working for the child, that, that they're asking for something more, something different. I remember speaking in, in New Jersey last year sometimes about the challenge of what people are talking about as emerging adulthood, you know, children going off to college. And this was, of course, before the pandemic which has thrown uh, at us uh, another set of circumstances that are that add to the complexity complexity of the situation and, and 
and part of what I was talking about at this event was it's okay. You know, it's okay if children fail. It's okay if even if they go to college and they fail out. A lot of parents become very, very anxious when that happens because parents associate with failure, with with low self-esteem, with with really the child taking a hit. But if we change our culture, right? If we change our family culture and our entire culture, then what we're learning is just what what doesn't work, that something needs attention and something needs help. And it's not the worst thing in the world. I, I say this often. I spend a good deal of my time trying to get this one principle across to parents, which is if we can embrace the struggle, the struggles, if we can embrace the struggles and the failures with as much creativity, optimism, and curiosity as we do the successes, we will make a huge shift in our parenting insight and skills. So, so it's okay. It's just we have to shift our thinking out of black and white, pass or fail. Right? We have to start thinking of, of, of this as a journey. And that some of the most valuable lessons are, are learned from failure, from, from running into a dead end. I remember somebody, I was doing a, uh, an interview on a podcast last year. And each interview with each parenting expert um, ended with saying, they asked you, what's, what's your one great lesson, your one great take home as a father, in my case. And I remember as I, they, they tell you this in advance of the interview. And as I was thinking about this, I remember thinking every single lesson that I have to share, every big idea that I have, I learned from failure. You know, I say this to your children out there in the field. Whenever I meet with them, I say to them, there's nothing wrong with you. Yeah, you've made mistakes and stupid decisions, but we all have. In fact, I say I've made as many or more than than you have. Just sheer volume, I've outdone you. But there's nothing wrong with you. And, And yes, there are going to be boundaries. And consequences, and that just is the way the world works. That's an inescapable part of the world. If you go over the speed limit, you're going to get a ticket. If you don't pay your taxes, you're going to get in trouble. On an, if you don't show up for work, you're going to lose your job. Consequences are impossible to escape. But that doesn't mean that you're bad or unlovable. And it doesn't mean something that's wrong with you. And so really what happens around academics is it's the place that is sticky where our environment where our anxiety gets stuck to it that's what it is it's the one area that we can look at that we all share universally we all are are in this together with school and academics we can look at that and we get anxious with struggles and failures detours i used to say at the beginning of every parent meeting remember this the most common complaint for evoke wilderness therapy clients, families, is academic struggles. That's the most common. And I used to say to parents at every parent meeting, I want you to imagine for this hour or two that you're not off track. That this detour is not a a detour from where you need to be. You're exactly where you need to be. Learning exactly what you need to be learning right now. So tonight's broadcast is really about having that perspective of not thinking about academics as the measure of success. This is the quote that I wanted to share with you. Academics is now. In my case, it was motivating. It was performance enhancing to have that that anxiety. And so my first semester, I didn't just get straight A's. I got the highest grade in the class. I leveled it off after that. And just sat, I was just satisfied with an A after that first semester. Obviously, drugs become, they start off as the solution, but then they become part of the problem. See, that's the problem, is that the the cure, in the case of drugs, is worse than the disease. Social problems in school, I mean, you know, 
the thing about school that's fascinating is that traditional mainstream school, it's a horrible design. Hundreds, if not thousands of students, classroom sizes of typically it's going to be 28 to 30 students, unless you're in a private school. The, the most vulnerable time of, of human development in terms of uh, us looking at how others see us and carrying that weight. And then you throw us into these large school setting where there's where there's poor ratios, parent to adult, or excuse me, adult to child, I should say. And then we wonder why it goes wrong. Again, uh, problems with authority can be a, a mask. Uh, you know, when I'm doing work with intensive, with folks at our intensive program, that's folks like you at our intensive program, adults, parents, or just adults. The, the, almost every session, there's a moment when we realize together, wouldn't it have, wouldn't it have been nice for you at some point in your journey and in your struggle, wouldn't it have been nice if somebody asked you how you were doing instead of focusing on getting it right? And if it, if one time would have benefited you, what if that was the culture? What if along with our boundaries, we replace judgment and, and, and reaction being reactive. What if we replace that with curiosity? Obviously anxiety and depression can be both the cause and the effect of academic difficulties and, and cause greater problems. Like I mentioned, there's a specific vulnerability to peer influence. The adolescent brain, which is a brain that, that it, when we talk about the adolescent brain, we're talking about 13 to 25 typically. There's some variation, but that's what uh, experts call the adolescent brain. It's specifically susceptible to peer pressure and peer influence. And because the prefrontal cortex is not fully developed, frustration, tolerance, and delay of gratification. One of the, the I remember this still, you know, there's just these moments and you don't know at the time how it's going to add up in your life. But I remember being in graduate school and we had this, this sheriff's deputy from San Bernardino County, California, come to the school that, that I was getting my master's degree at, talking about child abuse and reporting laws. And one thing he said to me, the, the, uh, an, or to us, an element in almost all cases of child abuse are an element that's included in almost all dynamics around child abuse is when an adult has age inappropriate expectations for a child. You know, the old cliche crying over spilt milk. I'm sure you've been frustrated at things that children have done. So have I, that are just children things to do. Later on, if the patterns become entrenched, we get angry and resentful. Instead of holding boundaries, we get angry and resentful in the hopes that the child will respond to our emotional field, our anger, and behave well so we don't have to set boundaries. That's, that's what happens over time. I've talked about this a little bit about how we use academics couple of credits, it fits into the, it becomes part of the clinical picture. Young adults have other options that adolescents don't. You can talk to your book therapist about that. Watching the relationship between the, the, the field staff and the clients with regard to academics is, it becomes this, this microcosm of the, the teacher student relationship. It becomes a way of kind of operationalizing change. I remember I had one one set of parents who came out um, and made a decision. They had considered this beforehand, but they made a decision to leave their child in the program because he hadn't finished his curriculum. He'd done some amazing amazing therapeutic work, great great letters, great sessions, um, great participation, great attitude, but the parents left. Now it took him a day. It took him a day 
to finish his academics. It's not that rigorous. And the parents were staying at a hotel in town waiting for him. But they said, we're going to give you time and, and it, eventually we're going to leave if you don't finish it. Because, because they said, now you've got all this stuff underneath you, there's still going to be some boundaries. So that's the question. When I asked Sanford, our academic specialist at Evoke, when I said, how do you know if it's a can't or a won't situation? And Sanford had the same idea that I give when I talk to therapists, which is you just learn. You learn to listen, to pay attention, to follow clues. You learn to push a little. You learn to give a little. You learn to provide some accommodations and support and see if they respond with that. It's, it's, a, it's a complicated, nuanced process for us to figure out. To, for us to figure out as parents how academics and academic success fits into the overall picture is so individual. And, and the other thing about it is it, it can't be manualized because it's not even the same for every child. Some children are going to be academically oriented and some children are not. And when we project on, I, I was saying in a training recently, and I caught myself right after I said it. I think I used, I didn't use the, the phrase normal thinking, but I talked about my way of thinking. And Sanford, who was running the training, said, did you hear yourself? And I said, yes, I heard it right after I said it. I was applying my way of thinking, my truth to the clients, to, to the therapist, to others. And that was a mistake that could end up in abusive behavior from me to them. Everything becomes grist for the mill, right? That's what wilderness therapy is. Everything becomes grist for the therapeutic mill. Academics become something we consider when we're recommending aftercare suggestions. What fits? What do they need? What works for them? If you have questions about academic or, or learning differences or diagnosis and you have the resources, I would absolutely recommend testing while your child is with us. That's not part of the, the core program, but there are psychologists that we have contact with that we have a working relationship that will go out to the field and do testing. Sometimes academics can inspire, like I said, and challenge in a positive way. Um, figuring it out is, is, is very personal, very, very, it's very difficult to manualize the answer to this question, but it's important to ask the question. So we have to come up with a new idea around success. Um, in my experience, I'm, I tend to have dis I've discovered over the years that once you get the, the head, the mind, or, or, or those are just analogies for, for, for symbols for mental health. Once you get that lined up, like in Goodwill hunting, then everything else will fit. Letting go of, of, of timeline expectations. I don't regret the fact that I started college at 21. Even today, I was just telling somebody today that my academic dropout, my decision to drop out, still affects me today. Specifically in, in terms of math, which might sound funny, but my inability to do math affected which college I could go to, which major I could have. Or I would have had to start off with eighth grade level math, right? I would have, I'd forgotten everything from my sophomore year. So I would have had to go back to pre-algebra and start with algebra again. So we have to let go of timeline expectations and norms. And, and that's our own stuff, right? That's our own self-comparison to the culture, worrying about judgments. That's our own shame. We use an independent study model. Some programs afterwards use an independent study model. That's the model I used when I went back to school. You know, and looking back, one of my challenges in school was I was bored. My, uh, and I, I grew up in Irvine, California, and we had a great school district, still do. 
So I'm not being critical of that, but I didn't feel challenged. My great strength is thinking. And school doesn't ask you to think a lot. And I remember some classes, a poetry class I had, Mr. Antinor, Mrs. McKenzie, and my 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 uh, sociology course. I remember some of them did a great job, but it wasn't a good match for me. And I was worried about failing. I was worried about the stress of being a failure. Um, we look at traditional versus mainstream approaches. You know, when you're talking about next step, you want a milieu that's going to be flexible with kids that have some of these challenges. If it's a rigid milieu, which is more mainstream, fewer accommodations, both therapeutically and academically, it's not going to fit for some of these kids. You know, do they have tools? Do they have support? Does the, does the setting make allowances for anxiety? Unless it's a therapeutic setting, that's going to be pretty difficult unless it's a really small ratio in a private setting. Um, and like I said, letting go of your own stigmas. I had the wrong slide there. I'm like take home slide. So I'm happy to take any questions that have come in. If any have come in. Have you ever thought of founding an aftercare program? We took one over that was struggling and we ran it for a few years and it, we, it, we eventually had to close it. We, we couldn't fix it. So yes. I've thought about it, um, but we haven't found success. And, and wilderness therapy is so therapy centric, and that's my love. It's so therapy centric that you know therapeutic schools after after evoke are are they have a lot more balls to juggle. It's difficult to run those schools, and it takes a lot of non therapeutic staff. Um, yeah. So yes, we've tried it. It's complicated. It doesn't happen to be my niche. Our, our expansion is into the parent work, which you're now in this moment participating in, and also our intensive program. And so I, I've leaned more toward the, the therapeutic side of things. Again, I have a bias that 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 that, that academics is a small part of, a, of our overall mental health. It's an important part. I love learning. It's what inspires me. I, I love reading and writing. I, I love ideas. I love being a student, but um, it, it, it's, it becomes a part of my mental health. It doesn't define it. So that's, that's our answer. Someone says our son was at Evoke and now he's at an aftercare program. And we noticed that you're teaching that you're teaching. Um, and we noticed that you're teaching are what changed us parents in the beginning, but still make the difference to challenge us and improve us along the journey. I think that's just a statement. Thank you. How do you get across to the child that it's okay to be behind? That's a great question. And I want to talk about that for, for a minute because you have to believe it. That's how you do it. You have to confront your own stigmas and your own shame your own comparison, your own family of origin ideas about what success and failure mean. It's really hard to superficially, in a simple step-by-step -step way, undo that kind of thinking, but you have to believe it. I've shared the story. If you look it up, you could you could Google this in a second and find the story. The founder of the, the, the clothing Spanx, some of you know what that is. It's Typically, I think it might be male and female, but started off as a female undergarment um, clothier. Um, but the founder of it tells a story about how her father, every night at dinner, would ask the children how they failed that day. And his idea was, if you're not failing, you're not trying. I remember when I was learning to ski, they would say the same thing. If you're not crashing, you're not trying. Um, and she shared, the CEO shared that when they had failures, their father would be proud and excited and interested. But if they didn't have failures that day, he would kind of act disappointed. 
And she said he was trying to teach us. This is the same thing that Brene Brown talks about in, in, in work culture, about vulnerability and success. When I work with really gifted, world-famous artists, they talk about failure being a part of the process. I'm in the middle of writing a, a blog on art and fear and creativity and how it relates to all of this. And you can't be a great artist if you can't embrace failure. It just doesn't work. You have to be willing to, to fail and be okay with it. So you've got to believe it. You, you've got to shift your thinking. You've got to lean into your stigmas, to your fear, to your shame, to your fears of being rejected. You've got to do your work. And, and maybe part of that work is discovering where you were given the message from your context, from your upbringing, that failure was bad. You know, Sigmund Freud that said that if you want somebody to succeed, give them something, give them a task that they're sure to fail at. If you want somebody to grow, he said, give them a task that they're sure to fail at. Carl Jung would often joke and say, when clients come in telling me that they lost their job or that they've separated, he would say, we should open up a bottle of champagne and celebrate. And when they came sharing that they just got a promotion or a new job or something just shifted and went their way, he would say to the client, if we really come together and support each other, I think we can make it through this time. And everybody's, those are all just anecdotal examples of, of thinking, but you really have to think about it differently. So you know what happens in all of this? If, if I think what happens in my work with families and children that are struggling with mental health and addiction is that families are asked to deconstruct their ideas of success. <clears throat> to extricate themselves from society's dominant messages about success. I think that's the idea. It's one of the ideas that comes out of this work. For those of you who, who have been on the journey a little bit farther, you know that that's true. You know that the same discussions with your, your friends don't make sense anymore. And, and you start to realize that there's this whole other world where there's depth and meaning in the struggle. I was just sharing, my 12-year-old just got a new therapist. This is one of the ways that we do in our family is that everybody has a therapist and being in therapy is normalized. Being in therapy is a sign of health. So even our 12-year-old, wants to have a therapist and she wanted to, to change therapists recently. So we, we said, sure. And gave her a new therapist. Well, this therapist had the idea that they were going to call the parents in first us because this therapist was a, a family systems therapist and wanted to see, learn about us first. And so in the middle of my conversation with the therapist on Friday, I was doing a zoom from this very chair right here. I was explaining how I've been in therapy for a lot of years and how it makes it kind of hard to talk to people. I don't have lots of friends and people that I can confide in. I feel kind of like a stranger in the world because what I've learned from the therapeutic process doesn't fit with mainstream culture. And as I was describing this kind of resigned kind of uh, sense of isolation from the world, my wife said to me afterwards, she said, you know, Brad, that didn't sound normal, just in case you're wondering. You were saying it like the therapist understood exactly what you were talking about. And some people don't understand what you're talking about. And I knew she was right. I mean, that's part of the problem. You guys are being asked and shoved into a different level of consciousness. And I know you that the first instincts are to solve the problem before you. But what this work, what Evoke Therapy Program's idea is that separates us from other parenting and family and therapy models is that it's about a shift, a fundamental shift in consciousness. And that the questions that we often have aren't the right questions. So we have to ask different questions and find qualitatively unique answers. Someone says, do you have suggestions? Oh, last question. And then I'll do a Q&A this, this, this week. Someone says, I was at the New Jersey event and we live in a community that is extremely focused on academics that, as success. It seems our educators and administrators are on the same path, probably because the parents 
and some students push them to go down this path. My son had AD, has ADHD and central auditory processing disorder. The teachers are expecting him to participate and self-advocate more than he is now. He is coming back to his district school from a small therapeutic school, and his district's goal is for him to advocate and speak up more. To continue on with that, someone says, do you have suggestions to explain to the teachers about how CAPD, Central Auditory Processing Disorder, and how this is difficult, to, difficult for him, besides hiring Sanford Shapiro, who knew exactly what is going on? I, I don't. Uh, that's probably why I would encourage you to, to hire Sanford. Any of you who have questions are, are free to, well, to reach out to Sanford. You can find him on our website, on our staff website. You can email them there and he's semi-retired. So he does consulting with us, but he can also give you, you can have a session with him where he gets some information and he would be our best resource. I, you know, it's sad because it's their job to know this stuff. And so they just need to educate themselves on these various learning styles, learning differences and learning disorders. So I don't have resources off the top of my head for that. My resource would be Sanford. I would call Sanford if I had your same question. I'm sorry. I wish I had a better, more succinct answer. All right. I will address any questions that I didn't answer. I will address them on our Thursday open forum. I'm going to be speaking before the debate. For those of you who want to watch the debate, the, the broadcast will be on before the debate. If you're interested, oh, by the way, I, I, this is important. If any of you are interested in an intensive and have been putting it off, we had a couple of folks drop off for health reasons, drop off last minute from our intensive that's happening this weekend. So it's very short notice, uh, but perhaps you can accommodate. It starts on Friday afternoon and evening, goes for a few hours, and then it goes all day Saturday and Sunday. So if you're interested in doing your own work, we have online intensives and we have an in-person intensive. The next in-person intensive that we have, I'm actually going to be running and it's going to, it's going to, I think there's one spot and, and by the end of the week, it'll be full. So if you're interested in doing an intensive with me in person, go to that. If not, you can go to our website or email intensives at evoketherapy.com. Pursuits trips are adventure trips anywhere in the world can happen between your wilderness adventure, wilderness experience and the next step or afterwards, or just a refresher. We have parent support groups. Check our, our website for parent resources. The next one will be October 29th at 6.30 p.m., 6.30 p.m. Thursday, October 29th at 6.30 p.m. We have a list of online parent support groups there. Our next uh, webinar will be this Thursday, the 22nd at 6 p.m. And we also have online support groups for alumni intensive. Our next one will be November 10th at 6 p.m. Email Malia at evoketherapy.com for more information. We ask all current parents to go to six 12-step support groups. We just ask you to try it. And if you learn nothing else, if you get nothing out of it, at least you'll know what it's like for your child to be asked to do something that he or she or they don't want to do where they feel uncomfortable and have to walk into a group of strangers and kind of expose themselves. So if nothing else, you walk away with that experiential empathy. Alan on Coda, Families Anonymous, all of these can be found online, Adult Children of Alcoholics. RefugeRecovery.org is a Buddhist-inspired recovery program, and NAMI.org is a great place for free resources in your local area. All these broadcasts are available on your favorite podcast app. Just search Finding, Who, Finding You, an Evoke Therapy podcast. Uh, we're on Twitter and Instagram, both Evoke Therapy and Evoke Therapy Intensives. We're also on Facebook as Evoke Therapy Programs or Evoke Therapy Intensives. You can find the foundation we have a foundation um, that helps people that can't afford therapy. So if you're interested in giving back, uh, we just had a very large and generous donation um, pledge to us to help some families. So we, we, we thank that family and we look forward to being able to help people that can't afford therapy. Go to evokefamilyfoundation.org. Um, and then the Evoke Therapy blog always has new information. That's on our website. My two books, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, and the audacity to be you are both available on Amazon. I know some people prefer not to shop on Amazon, but it happens to be a place where us small booksellers and authors can sell our books. So that's where that's where it's available. You can also buy it through the, the Amazon Smiles program through the Family Foundation. And a small percentage of your proceeds goes to help people who can't afford therapy. 
All right. I'll be talking to you this Thursday at 6 p.m. Thursday, October 22nd at 6 p.m. I'll take any unanswered questions there and any new questions on any topic you might have then. I hope this has been a helpful point of contact. I hope it's a, a nice boost to you in between your phone calls with your child. For those of you that are listening, check out evoketherapy.com for more information about our wilderness therapy program and all of our programs, including our intensives and pursuits and coaching programs. We have a therapeutic coaching uh, program for people that want to do teletherapy and, and video therapy with, with, with folks across the country. So you can check that out there. Thanks for joining me this evening, folks. Talk to you on Thursday. Take care. Bye-bye.